So hello, Matt, and welcome to Decoding the Academics, Decoding Academia, instantiation number two. <laughs> the, that's, that's, you know, just French words we sometimes use in academic parlance. Well, I feel like the pilot is, has been done. The pilot is out there, and this is episode... It was, com it was commissioned uh, on the basis <laughs> of how well it was received. Yes, that's accurate. <laughs> and I see that you're competing with your Zoom background To I have a large set of books here and mm. behind me, whereas you've gone for quantity over quality. The, my image is ancient tomes of knowledge. And, and you've just, you're just like, you know, an Englishman's parlor where he's, he's got a show books for when he's entertaining <laughs> guests. Yes. Most of those are copies of the Guinness Book of Records of various years. <laughs> <I suppose. laughs> I really enjoyed those when I was a kid. So yeah, I have to come yeah. around. But, but the fact is we're discussing fake Zoom backgrounds. And I know that we shouldn't be comparing fake Zoom backgrounds because they're not real much. They don't mean anything. They're not, no, they're not. We know, we know they're not real. We're not stupid. We, we, yeah. we know that. Yeah, it's <laughs> just an image. <laughs> That's right. And to demonstrate that we are not stupid, we're going to focus this week on an academic who, it's fair to say he's been around a very long time. He's, he's built up a substantial body of research he's now a bit long in the tooth you know the the young dogs are looking to take him down but but still you know we, we got a humor and we got to we got to talk about the how it used to be in the old days and and that kind of thing so it's one matthew brown look at that yeah, yeah the nice one Woo! the nice yeah. one <laughs> and the cool one according to the uh, diagram that somebody made. I know. I know. Nice and cool. Nice and cool. Mm. Oh. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. I've been around for a while. I'm feeling it now. I I actually recently got um, an email from the university congratulating me and inviting me to an award ceremony, mm -hmm. and it's my ten years service award. So I've been wow. there for ten years. How um, long have you been there? <laughs> yeah. <no>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. About 10 years, yeah. Um, so I didn't like that, Chris. Yeah, that makes, 10 years. <laughs> that makes you, like, if they, like if I see any like golden watches or something, I'm, I'm, I'm out of there. I'm, they, you won't see me for dust. And it's not just because uh, you steal golden watches at the first sight of them. It's, it's, no. it's the symbolic length of your career that that represents. Yeah. Like I used to be, you know, I used to be the, um, the hot young thing. You know, I used to be um what's what's the word for the for the young brilliant one that the um, chris <laughs> not the chris <laughs> yeah. uh but yeah no i'm, I'm not that anymore. hot shot um, hot shot no there's a better word young Don't buck worry. well yeah these are all synonyms for what i'm thinking of <laughs> yeah okay you're, you're in the, <laughs> the um yeah but rising i'm not that anymore star. rising star rising yeah, still not that, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I, let's see, where shall I begin? I'll begin... Well, my, let me say we have a problem, right? Because in my case, my research career is so shallow that it's, it's not hard to find which topic I should talk about. But in your case, you have such an impressive back catalog, so many <laughs> topics of expertise, that it's actually hard for us to narrow down what we should talk about. So what we thought uh, might be a good approach would be for you to take an overview for your research career and then I can bother you with questions about uh, various aspects and and mm. stuff that comes up right yeah right and hopefully some of it's uh, you can find something interesting in it because I, I look back through what I've done and it's all very technical and and so on and um I'm worried that there might not be the nice, interesting hook. Like with you, you've got, you know, religion and rituals. It's, you know, that's... It's sexy. Can... It's the sexy. thing the kids are talking about these days. <laughs> Jordan Peterson lectures about Jesus. That's what they want to hear. What did the Buddha say? <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's true. But, you know, um, the, 
the sense I was getting from looking at the Reddit and stuff, which is that actually people like it on one hand it feels super self-indulgent to like okay this is the story of my career and all the things I've done on the other hand um I could think you know there are a lot of people who might be considering getting into research might be considering studying psychology might be interested in the kinds of places it can lead you and um yeah maybe my and you're gonna disabuse them <laughs> and, and, and tell them all why they should immediately say, cash in those dreams and and go, go and study de- go industry. and study <laughs> go into dentistry that's where the money is just get that's... in there all right uh all right shall i begin shall i tell you yeah take us from the the start matt and i'm, I'm one thing to say also all academics to some extent think that their own research is like not interesting but i think i mean some people's research isn't interesting but <laughs> there there often is that the people are actually doing interesting research also don't think their research is interesting so you're you're just a stereo there's no way to tell we'll have to listen and not let people decide for themselves because yeah. because if your research was fascinating you would say the same thing this is what i'm saying matt you you can't be judging this subjectively yourself all right i'll i'll just tell you and i'll let you and the audience be the judge so i did i finished my phd in 2002 i ended up doing a phd because um right after i studied um, psychology or behavioral science they call it over here um i were in a recession in australia and um couldn't find a job didn't know what to do uh so i was unemployed for like a while and um and at the time you could uh, if you were a, had a university degree you could get a, a sweet gig teaching English in Japan so that's what I did after um, after a while and uh, so I did that and I was teaching English in Japan and that's a really pleasant job it, it paid well by you know by the standards at the time and um, and it's such an easy job it's just conversational English you didn't need any skills and and all the students are really nice that they're, they're Japanese and they're, and they're there it's like you know they're doing it as a hobby you're disparaging the English teacher community in Japan. Uh, that's a huge it's, portion of our audience. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not. It's not a real job. Matt, <laughs> I I don't sign off on this English teaching community in Japan. Don't harass me. I harass him on Twitter. Um. So teaching English was nice, but it was really, really, really boring. Like really boring. It's you. Yeah. It my. I wanted to eat my brain, um, gnaw off my arm or something. And so I would go to Kinokunya and I would grab these increasingly um, like heavy going technical books about artificial neural networks and mathematics and just weird stuff. And Kinokunya I realized- is a bookshop in Japan. That, that's probably context that people need to know. Book, bookshop, it's yeah. chainsaw. Carry on. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so made that decision. Said, right, okay, well, I'll, what I need to do is get a more interesting job. I didn't want to be unemployed again. Uh, so I thought, well, okay, I'll, uh, I'll do a PhD. So I went back to Australia, went back to my old uni um, and um, started, uh, did a PhD in psychophysiology. So that's with the EEG, sorry, you're smiling. Why? It just it it sounds like you know after watching Foundation that you're like saying psycho history or whatever it is. So when you said it, I was it's, like, huh? You you did? You studied that? <laughs> it's not a made up word. It's a real thing. Uh, so that's that's just um, using basically EEG, yeah, the electroencephalogram, and recording event related potentials, which is just. EEG that's time locked to a particular stimulus or a behavior. And uh, you know, doesn't just isn't that mm-hmm. similar to like James Hellers, the like reform researcher guy? I thought he was like somebody that focused on like biofeedback and measurement. Is that his field? Just just out of curiosity, I, random question. I actually I actually don't know about him specifically, but that biofeedback and stuff is definitely a subset. It's not really like it is based on the EEG, but it's not really. Um, no, yeah, no, you could get just, it. It's a- <laughs> yeah, you, you <laughs> seem very keen to get into it, so I'll I'll accept that answer and move on. <laughs> um, 
but I, I didn't find like the problem with the EEG, and this is a problem that you've talked about in the podcast, Chris, which uh, with things like, like, you know, fMRI and things like that, you know, you could do this various signals from the brain, whether it's electrical or blood flow or whatever, um, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, the problem is, is okay, you've, you've, you've measured this sort of blobs of activity and trying to connect it with some observable behavior or stimulus and it's all a bit like you know going through the tea leaves and so on so I, I didn't end up loving EEG that much but I did I was interested in the statistical and mathematical signal processing tools that you could use to kind of extract the signals from the noise and um, do classification and all of those things so I ended up doing quite a technical PH or publishing a bunch of very technical things in sort of medical and biological engineering and clinical neurophysiology and that kind of thing. So I ended up being doing this very sort of geeky, dorky stuff, which I could explain, but it would involve like describing things like wavelets and time frequency transforms and, and so on. So I'm not sure if I should. So um, you don't need to. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to, do I? <laughs> so, but that, that sort of technical background brought me to uh, back to Japan for a postdoc to um, work in a, a lab in Japan, which was affiliated with the German National Research Center, the, the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, which had a lab there. And we were working with mobile robotics. And um, in particular, so I was focusing on the sort of image or video processing and basically trying to make intelligent systems for processing to make autonomous robots that could process the video and make intelligent decisions about that. So it's kind of like an you know embodied cognition uh, in a way, but, but very applied. Now, are I'm, you the man I'm, responsible for Pepper? The robot is that you? You be no. him? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, no, I didn't have anything to do with Asimo, uh, Asimo either. <laughs> you you knew him, of course, but just you know, the, uh, yeah. the, he's the, that little robot just walking around, and you know, everyone knew him, but you weren't directly involved with him. I understand. You, you know, in Star Wars, in on the Death Star, there's those little black boxes on wheels that would go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and Chewbacca would scare you. And like, that's what our robot looked like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, well, that's yeah, slightly less humanoid, but maybe more functional. In, in, in any <laughs> yeah. case, I'm not sure yeah, what they're doing in Star Wars. Those little like mice droids. It, uh, I don't think it's ever made clear. Yeah, maybe they're pets. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the droids in Star Wars can also, like, as shown, you know, they 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 can feel pain on their feet. So they're they're just a very weird thing which they've they've put into the design brief there. So yeah, <laughs> there's not to delve into it too deeply. Just just don't just, to <laughs> just the don't think about it. Don't <laughs> think about it and enjoy it. Okay. So we were working with um, yeah artificial neural networks, which are really cool. They're they're really a fun thing to to um, to, to, to talk about um, because um, they um, we, we were working with some these things called convolutional neural networks, which were the quite deep neural networks with many layers, and they actually operated via these what's called convolutional filters that would kind of convolve over. Uh, an entire image and extract features. Is convolve a real verb? Is that a real verb? Yeah, look it up, you, Chris. Look okay, it up. Okay, yeah, okay. You'll find it. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm learning things. I'm already learning things today. So you were <laughs> involved in convolutional research with convolving rays. Um, all, carry on. <laughs> all the listeners with a background in signal processing, please join me in mocking Chris at this moment. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I'm realizing, Matt, that you have the technical depth that were you to put our expertise in gurology to nefarious purposes, you would be able to draw on oh, a, like a I, massive storage <laughs> box of jargon, the likes of, of, of which Eric Weinstein <laughs> only only dreams of it so yeah. i know it, it, it's a terrible power that i choose not to exercise it, it's such a straight for now um, for now for so now. carry on sorry i i convolutedly interrupted your uh, discussion of convolutions okay. anyway 
So there was a particular sort of uh, framework for these things that was created by uh, a guy called Lecun, French guy called Lecun, L-E-C-U-N. And uh, he is since has become sort of the lead chief technical officer or whatever at Google or Facebook or one of those places, Apple or whatever. And why, I hear you ask, because these little things, um, along with some other sort of stuff that was happening with with Hinton and so on, became the deep learning, you know, mm. whole, the whole deep learning paradigm. So we were actually implementing these sort of deep um, uh, neural networks and they weren't recurrent. That, that was that was something special. That that's very important. Later on. I was a question that was just bubbling in my. Were they recurrent? No, I got it. <laughs> no, so, no, okay. no, I want to. I want to quash those rumors right now. <laughs> so it's good um, to keep that clear. So, but yeah, yeah, you got but, that, but listeners. His, but but here's on. the thing. Here's the thing. This is the moral of the story. I could have been a contender, Chris, if we just stuck with it, right? <laughs> like, because 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 these guys became super famous and rightly so. Because this is the sort of you know super AI that was the new revolution. But at the time, back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, everyone, everyone had given up on artificial neural networks, right? It, they, they, mm. were, they were in the cold. And the only people, I swear to God, as far as I know, the only people doing anything with these deep <laughs> neural networks that Lacun, who nobody heard of, right? His paper had like about 13 citations, right? <laughs> it was like, and um, just we'd stumbled across it and we'd implemented it for our little robot and it worked great. It worked fine. It went really well. And we were like, oh, that's nice. Okay. And, and we, you know, wrote up some little papers um, and we just went to conferences and presented them. Hey, you know, we did this thing. Look, it's got these layers and stuff and it worked really well. And then forgot about it and moved on and did other things. Later on, <laughs> I find out that, yes, this is the computational artificial revolution discovery that is, you know, so you I should... missed out, Chris. I was this close. Look, was this this close. is our version of, you know, Brett and Eric talking about... <laughs> How, what what happened right and like as far as i can tell matt you were the single researcher that had the possibility <laughs> to unlock neural networks and and machine learning ai and it just you know is it was it really you know just chance and you you know the the, the death sounds of it or was it some nefarious force was like yeah this guy doesn't he's not going to get the credit and if That's you were credited stopped. on one of those papers, Matt, well, this would be a very be, different podcast now. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I'd be getting eight-figure salaries at Google right now. But they have they stole my ideas and they ran away with it. No, of course, the truth is we were just one of the also-rans. You know, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't persevere. We didn't keep going. And um, good luck to them. I'm happy for them, Chris. Not, not <laughs> I can tell. Up. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. <good> at all. <laughs> yeah, it's, see, that's just, just listeners, just a note. This is the difference when when people say, you know, why are you, you guys are gurus, right? No, we know we're cogs in the machine. <laughs> we we know that. We we accept our clunking position uh, in, in that mechanism. So that's the difference. All right. The one of the there. differences. It's not the only one. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, the other difference is we're funnier. We're, we're, well, we're funny. that's a, 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 a Yeah. <laughs> We're funnier than Brett and Eric. That's that's true. I'm I'm thinking of Brett and Eric. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Okay. So what happened next? What happened next? I know the 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 tension is killing you. So you Um, missed you missed the boat in one field of research, and then what what happens? um, So I went back home to Australia, not blissfully unaware that I missed the innovation of the century. (laughs) Because <laughs> um, I was homesick, basically, and um, my um, my my wife, who's currently my wife now, um, very kindly agreed to come back Obviously. with me. That's nice. And, yeah. yeah, that's nice. And um, so um, you know, I got something, Chris. I didn't leave Japan into empty-handed. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, actually, that now makes sense because I find it strange that you uh, married were married to a Japanese woman. Who you met in Australia when you lived in Japan, uh, but now obviously this m- no. makes much more sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, like, no, no. yeah, I mean, I learned about the Australian Italian community, so there might be an Australian Japanese community as well. Like, so yeah, there is, there is, there is. My wife avoids it. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so um, then I worked at CSIRO. For, so yeah, okay. So it's basically now like a stats and maths and engineering type AI guy. Boffin. Very, you were a boffin. I was a boffin. <laughs> I was a quant. Uh, yeah, cool. in, in, a shit kicker quant is basically was where I was at. In my was career. that what they said on your CV? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um so i got a job at um oh at, at Griffith at a university here as a postdoc in um in uh, actually ocean stuff so it's um so it was um like a field called coastal engineering where they sort of study the waves and the wind oh shit i thought you meant like ocean the personality like uh you know no. the big five so no, actual ocean the oceans so um we did stuff like um yeah like like we there's these global wind wave models and we did these spectral artificial neural network and sort of like various simulated models of how that all works and um yeah you know what, was, it's like you a... actually have technical scientific competence <laughs> <laughs> in, in actual <laughs> like fields of research that are not social science related this is I'm glad we had this discussion. <laughs> you didn't. I know. I know. I don't. Uh, I have very little skills in social sciences, really. Um, uh, we don't, I mean, can you run a regression model? But <laughs> like, so that's uh, <laughs> this is why I'm. I'm more like, oh no, I, you know, I gotta watch what I say. I have to. I've, I've, I didn't realize what I've been sitting next yeah. to. I feel I've very inadequate now. I've been judging you the whole time for your lack of understanding of things like that's right multi-level models <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i do those in my sleep <laughs> uh yeah yeah so i was publishing stuff like like weird just weird statsy stuff that no one's going to care about like uh, like polynomial multi-scale polynomial filters for smoothing nobody cares oh you care thank you chris um okay there's one thing i did i did okay like I'll dip my toe into the technical stuff, right? So there's one thing I did, which was a geometric approach to non-parametric density estimation, right? Which sounds a bit technical, but you know about you know about. I know parametric density. distributions. Yeah, yeah, I, that's right. I know no, geometric I'm... unity. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing, Chris. I'm not going to baffle you with bullshit. I'm not going to pull an Eric on you. I'm gonna. You will understand what I'm talking about, right? Okay. So, so you know that normally you got some data, you got some points scattered yep. about. On a on a on a plane on a space. I'm with and, you so um, far. <laughs> yep. And 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 you can put like a normal distribution, then the, the bell shaped mm -hmm. curve. You know, it's like a Mexican hat. Can can you imagine it, Chris? Like it's like a. <laughs> I kind of wear one every weekend. So yes, I've got it. <laughs> yeah. I've got it. In my yeah, mind's yeah. eye. Exactly. Now that those are, and there are lots of other distributions with different shapes, and they're all parametric distributions, right? Because they they involve some parameters that. That, that describe it but you know you can do non-parametric what about if you threw away those parametric models because they're so constraining yeah that's right throw it away it's just like <laughs> take it take it <laughs> it's gone and it's like you know discarding clothes and going to a new speech and you just what if you just let the data speak to you and 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 don't have any model don't have any parametric model or try to avoid having a model yeah i know okay Right, and so there are ways to do it. So there are things called tessellations. There are um, um, uh, Delaunay uh, tessellations and Voronoi tessellations, right? Which basically just they create a tessellation around words. the points. Are these, are these real, real words? words? <laughs> I, I don't, okay, we'll skip over this bit, right? No, just... carry I, look, carry on. I'm following that. I, I'm not. I, I've got it. I've got it. Carry on. To, to sort of cut to the chase, it, there's, there were just ways to generate an estimate of a smooth sort of curvy type distribution, like the good old normal distribution that covers the whole space, um, that, that fits the, the data points that you've got in the space, but doesn't really have any assumptions about the shape that it's supposed to have. Um, so this is handy for stuff like astrophysics, where you've got all these stars up there and they have all these filaments and all these weird sorts of things, and they want to kind of have a smooth kind of density that kind of describes, you know, where the stars are really, you know, where, where they're most likely to be. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I had some, I had some, had some yeah, ideas about how to do that kind of thing. Sir, I have a question. Is this yes, why whenever Caleb is trying to baffle uh, you and various other people, with his fat tail distribution malarkey. Yes. Um, that you find it 
less impressive than some others seem to do because you have actually you have actual expertise in distributions and how to model them and whatnot. So what he's saying is not, you know that it's not as revolutionary as he portrays it to be. Yes, absolutely. And I'm not including my own stuff in that. Like, you know, most of the stuff I did, in fact, all of it, just say all of it, has been totally superseded by these people in statistics that are far, far smarter than me and have done things like these, like distribution fitting things and curve fitting things that make none of those assumptions. And they have, like amazing qualities and the stuff that Taleb is arguing against is like 1950s statistics. Mm -hmm. Like it's like a caricature. It's like a straw man of statistics, which doesn't reflect See, anything that's the, happened since 1970. The thing that like sort of surprises me about this is like, this seems like it would be relevant information to mention to people when we discuss Taleb. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't mention it. And then we got emails from people saying, has Matt seen that Taleb has, you know, like books about fat tail probabilities and, and stuff. And um, so I'm just saying, Matt, your modesty, it caused us to get emails. <laughs> <laughs> you get dragged unnecessarily. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so that's that. Um, after that, I went to... Uh, the CSIRO, which is Australia's science and technology government organization. So not a university, but sort of government science sort of thing. The desk. Um, yes. Working Desk's for the government on, their, in on their, sec their secret projects. That's mm -hmm. right. And I, I can't say too much about that because it's all very <laughs> hush hush. And no, I can. Um, so we're doing interesting stuff like, it was, again, all stats and maths, but for the, for the sort of marine uh, and atmosphere people. And that was fun. So we did things like, like estimating the distribution of species across the Great Barrier Reef. So, you know, like thousands and thousands of species and um, all these different geophysical conditions. And, you know, it's a challenge like to figure out where everything is because it's hugely complicated. And like, where, where are the plants and the, 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 the benthic species and the, the corals and the, 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 the fish and the prawns and so on? Under the water. I can help you. Yes. I could have done it. Most, <laughs> mostly, mostly under the water. Yes. Uh, um, so I use some are um, under yes. the sand. That's an important qualification. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's some tricky stats problems there, which were fun. Um, and then, then Chris, this is the twist. This is the twist. This is the exciting twist. Um, I was there for a while, quite happily, taking it easy, pretty much, really. Um, but I saw, like, and I saw a nice career at CSRO. But I thought, you know, it's, it just it seemed to, it was like. I, I saw these old guys, these old hands, you know what I mean? Probably, probably my age. They're probably my age. The age that oh, I'm now is probably, the age, yeah. It's what the ancient. Then and yeah. Ancient. Neat. Yeah. And I looked at them and I went, look at these. I don't want to be like that. I want, you know, this is, I don't want, I don't, I don't want my future mapped out for me. And I quit. Um, and I, I left science and academia completely to go and build stairs with my dad. <laughs> a few years yeah, that old chestnut the hot shot starts the science researcher who who throws it all in to build stairs with their dad it's a tale as old as time <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah but um so they, we didn't build any old stairs right built big commercial stairs for skyscrapers and stuff so really fancy lawyers and stuff like that they need to impress people when they come you built stairs for like for the high powered people to walk on yeah 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 high powered people and so that was soul destroying about it because when you realize like what's the point i remember being taken up in one of these big buildings um that was being built and, and we we were built we were in the process of building them like a one and a half million dollar staircase right to go in their foyer which was awesome by the way um um, to completely clad in Corian and like a coiled spring. It was beautiful. Um, Corian did like an bounce, stone. Like, could you bounce? <laughs> yeah. It did. That's right. That's oh. why it had to be a spring. It had to be a spring because originally we designed it so it was too rigid, right? And um, apparently the these huge floors with the concrete and stuff would, would flex with the heat and move like maybe a centimeter or two and it would just go like if, if it was too rigid. So it had to be a spring to kind of Mm. so so it, it weighed like 12 tons but it was a 12 ton spring spring um, sounds like i could design stairs i have a yeah yeah anyone, anyone can <laughs> i mean you know you just you know anyone but can, can you i put, ask you put your mind to it 
a question then uh, as my role as questionnaire inquisitor here uh so when you say you like built stairs you weren't an architect right so you didn't like you know rock up and draw a stair and then give it to someone so were you like a hard hat man like there like digging i don't know digging rock and putting, i don't know how people build stairs whatever the way they do to build stairs or like where were you were you the man telling people that they should build stairs or uh well it was a small a small business right speciality type type contracting business so it was like all hands to the wheel at many times so i was there like sand grinding and sanding and stuff like that a lot of the time and <laughs> i remember one time i was there and i was going to pick up one of these massive like steel members that was going to go into one of these things and, and the big i'm not going to make like, a joke i'm not that pure I'm not <laughs> <continue>. <laughs> and i had my hands around this massive steel member and <laughs> carry on and, uh, carry on. <laughs> and, uh, and the proper tradies right the proper the proper guys that were there that actually had muscles and stuff said no 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 mate you're gonna do yourself an injury you know that's sending me away like uh but i was helping chris i was helping you were there times. you were contributing but, no but mainly i was i was doing the engineering like in the technical drawings and stuff so we'd use autodesk inventor which is like a like a like a, a technical drawing, three-dimensional drawing program. And and we'd, we'd, and so I would do that. And it's not that hard. It's not that hard because it has all of the things that will compute the stresses and all that stuff. And we'd take it to an engineer, a proper engineer, one with certifications and stuff, who would then sign off on it and say, this won't fall Good. down. I'm glad you didn't go down an alley and get a budget engineer. to sign off on you. How does this look? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Yeah. But, but it's You're quite, cheap, it's quite, <laughs> it's quite interesting how the sort of super high tech software and stuff like he would laboriously do his hand calculations and stuff but we already knew it was fine because hmm. software told us it was fine so anyway um so then i'd learned that dad's secret plan was to retire and leave me holding the bag the, and having the to stairs stair bag yeah. yeah. And let me tell you, and you know, a little thing about the construction industry. I don't know if anyone listening has had any experience with the construction industry, but they're, they're rough and, you know, the culture is pretty rough and ready and they, it's all about making money and everyone's pretty, you know, like they're, they're okay, salt of the earth and stuff, but it's, it's not, it wasn't. You know, Are you uh, subtly hinting that the Australian stair mafia got involved with your business and, <laughs> the, that legendary organization the the italians are there it's you know yeah. it's it's but, been below the surface matt in the implicitly hinted at in previous weeks let me just put it this way like you know like woke twitter would find it very confronting the, the oh okay the kind of culture it was it was yeah. I know what that's like. I grew up in Belfast. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're mad. At, you're mad at the people. You're you're a boy from the streets. You know. That's you, right. <laughs> yeah. I, I. I. Yeah. I'm not going to make any any jokes. Belfast is a nice place. <laughs> so, anyway, so I changed my mind again. Decided I didn't want to do that anymore. What can I do? Um, I started applying for academic jobs, and no one would have me, Chris. No one would have me. Like it's, very, it's very hard to get back into academia when you just leave it for several years. Um, so eventually I found this little university called Central Queensland University, had to move out of the big smoke and move to a little country town in order to get the job, which was at the time seemed devastating. Um, but it turned out to be a great call. We went, you know, it's like a sea change. We ended up here um, in this little little hamlet by, by the ocean and um, rock it up to a sleepy little campus and um so I joined a psychology department so I came full circle circle is complete I well you weren't roots. in the psychology department to begin with though you were in the like psychophysiology uh department was that, oh, that was that was that was in psychology yeah oh is that is that an area of psychology I learned something yeah, every yeah, day. Yeah. So, yeah psychology psychology does that technical um stuff that's uh, um, yeah. you're you're an I, anthropologist. You wouldn't understand. But. I I know I, there's perceptual. That I'm in the cognitive. I'm surrounded by cognitive uh, psychologists. I know I know what they're doing. So so <laughs> okay. So you went. You came back, and and they accepted you. They accepted me. Yep, as a as another shit kicker, as a lecturer, 
um, there. And um, that was 10 years ago, as I said at the beginning, exactly 10 years ago. And uh, I've been there. And yeah, since then, we've done a lot of research on gambling, on addiction, um, but also um, on um, other addictive things like vaping, uh, nicotine. Podcast, yeah. Um, <laughs> Anti-vax stuff, um, looking at vaccine hesitancy and conspiracy, you know, just weird beliefs, um, conspiracy theories, that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I got back into the psychology, you know, um, after not having done it for since forever. Did the, did the conspiracy, uh, sorry, not the, the, the conspiracy belief stuff come out of the which came first, the addiction stuff or the conspiracy stuff, or were they simultaneous? Yeah, kind of simultaneous. Like I, I was always more interested in the conspiracy stuff and the, just the weird beliefs. Like, you know, we did a bit of work on religion and spirituality and the kinds of personality traits and cognitive styles and whatever that might predispose you to those things. And so I've always found that stuff really interesting, but that doesn't pay the bills. Yeah, like to... to to have a career in academia, you need to get funding. And um, um, the thing about is Australia is... Subtle hmm? dig at me? I don't know. I haven't seen your CV, Chris, but I don't know. I'm um, sorry. I'm uh, sorry if I touched the nerve. Um, no, just, but... uh, uh, you're just, uh, just wrong, Matt. Just it's a, a very <laughs> false assumption. But, uh, okay. it, you know, I would somebody studying religion and trying to get funded imagine oh, imagine yeah. that <laughs> yeah yeah well you know the, the funding situation in places well in australia and i assume probably in many other places too is like they don't fund sort of pure research very much it's all very much applied research and um so it's hard you have to be like really brilliant you have to have this like stellar career and this is perfect track record and so which i never had so i just wasn't really in contention for that kind of thing so that kind of research was always like a passion project that i'd do with, with little bits of money here and there um as a side gig in a way and with you know phd students and so on and um but you know in australia we've got massive gambling participation it's one of the strains of the biggest gamblers in the world um and this massive amount of gambling revenue flows in you know a lot of it goes to the companies um most of it comes from people with problems um and a lot of it goes to the government though in these special taxes and the government spends like a tiny percentage of that on um you know you know providing services and you know counseling treatment that kind of thing and a percentage of that goes to research so it's a tiny percentage of a small percentage of a huge amount of money which is still mm. a pretty large amount of money so um so as a result um, I found myself doing quite a lot of um, research and gambling and looking at the harms uh, and the distribution in the population, you know, like, like what actually happens. Like there's this weird thing with gambling where they think of it like, like, so like if you said to somebody, you know, the only people that get harmed by alcohol are, are clinical alcoholics. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, nobody gets, would get hurt by alcohol abuse. Right. If you said that to someone, they'd go, no, that's not, yeah. that's clearly not true. Right. Yeah. But with, but with gambling, the interesting thing is, is that there's this sort of um, collective delusion that the only impacts from gambling are happening to this quite small percentage, about 0.7 to 1% to 1 of the population that have meet compulsive the clinical criteria gambling. for compulsive gambling or problem gambling. Um, so one of the things that I've focused on that's caused that, you know, we, we find ourselves test, you know, providing expert um, <clears throat> testimony to royal commissions and things and um, various states of Australia and New Zealand, um, commissioning reports and things like that um, to show that actually the impacts spread as you'd expect more broadly than just the sort of clinical people. And that has sort of drawn me into a lot of these, you know, where there's a lot of money at stake, there's the politics, it's, you know, it, it's, um, yeah. Um, so that sort of drawn me in a little bit into the policy stuff. Um, so there are, gambling like a lot of fields has kind of these different components you know like you've got you've got these people that are kind of i don't want to call them industry shills but they they are they industry get, shills they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, let's just say they they get money you don't from, need to name names we can just say like, there is a category of people who may be 
chilling. They all may not be chilling. Industries. For industry, yeah. And in the sense that they receive money from the industry and they always seem to find conclusions that are kind of favouring more liberal gambling policies and against any kind of measures to kind of restrict it. Have you never heard yeah. of coincidences? That's just, you know, yeah. just mm. chance. <laughs> and, and, and the kind of frame, the kind of um, perspective on the issue that they favour is that there is a tiny percentage of people in the population who have some kind of crazy mental disorder that leads them to have gambling problems, but otherwise the products are perfectly safe and fine. All right. Sounds um, right. Sounds about right. It, yeah. Yeah. Mm, sounds about right. On. Yeah. And that's not not really true. Um, on the other hand, you do have these activist researchers, right? People that are just like gung ho on gambling is the most evil thing in the world. You've got to stamp it out, you know. Um, and um, I don't really feel affiliated to them either because they they have more of this activist and the state of mind. A predetermined answer. conclusion answer, yeah. And so we 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 try to sit kind of in the middle and and try to, yeah, do what researchers are meant to do, which is you know evidence, just just focus on gathering evidence and have, um, you know, let the let the evidence lead you to the conclusions. Yeah. Point of order. Um, I've heard on online. And various complaints directed at our podcast that we are uh, shills for mainstream institutions and that we simply defend the status quo or whatever government uh, recommendations. So I feel to see how this fits with your presentation of yourself as somebody who is not doing the bidding of the government or is arguing against industry interests Matt it's almost as if you are not simply accepting whatever the mainstream status quo that the government says but that can't be right because that's that that's not what I've heard you know the the critiques are quite clear that you will uh, not criticize anything when it comes from an official institution so what are you playing at what what's this about I will criticise uh, government policy and the government and many state governments in Australia would much prefer that researchers didn't rock the boat, you know, because, you know, you don't want inconvenient things because, you know, electorally, it's very difficult for them to cut off the um, revenue that comes from something like gambling because then they'd have to either cut services or they'd have to find the revenue from somewhere else, which both, both options are electoral disasters, which is why the situation persists. And look, um, Matthew here is a modest mouse, as, as is often the case, because his research uh, is influential enough that you were almost deposed, right, recently for a some review, some kind of court-based review of evidence. Like, I'm butchering what happened, but I understood from what you said that there was a desire which eventually got it to cross-examine you about your research to kind of take it apart, right? By the, we won't call them industry shills. We'll just see industry favorable people uh, who, who, if they were to poke holes in some of your research would be able to uh, encourage more lax regulation of the gambling industry. And you didn't, you escaped doing your patriotic Judy, um, perhaps because they were afraid of you. I said it, Matt, not you. <laughs> they, might have, they might have feared your rapier intellect. But, but that does suggest that people <laughs> actually pay some attention to things that you have put to print about, on this topic. Well, you know, gambling is a very niche field. You know, it's a very small pond. So, yeah. Um, is it? It's, yeah. Like I, as an academic discipline. Yeah. It's not a big. It's not a big well, thing. let me ask you this. Could you, with your knowledge, t- turn evil, like, you know, take your information and I, I want, like, there's two paths I see for you to become evil, Matt. Well, three paths. One's become a guru. We've established that that would be possible with your uh, expertise oh. and jargon. In, and, and Yeah, I know a lot of mathematical words. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, <laughs> and your 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 charismatic come hello charm but the so guru is an option that's always on the cards second is that i feel that 
if you are somebody who knows the research literature well, you also know the flaws and so on well. So if you were, you know, to flip sides, you would be able to critique your research and the other people doing similar research to you in a way that uh, would be more effective, right? I've, I've had letters from Philip Morris and people come and talk to you at conferences and stuff like that to sound you out to see whether you'd be interested in you are, know, doing you know, doing doing something together. It's kind of vague. Are they the talking you're... with the machines that they poke to the front? You know, <laughs> ah, <laughs> <"F-> you. <laughs> yeah. No, no, they're really nice. They wear nice suits and they they they're really fun. They're always quick to shout drinks and stuff. They they they're, they're they're charming people. They're a lot more charming than the the social justice activist people that are kind of not much fun. Mm. <laughs> so they they don't have a I... reputation for being the life of the party. Um, but yeah, so yeah. so that's well that answers one question. There is an evil path open to you, and we can potentially use this to support the podcast that we need. Mm. So that's good. You know, mm-hmm. the other one that I uh, the second evil path that I'm uh, wondering if you're capable of exploiting is with your knowledge of gambling, how people encourage gambling, how they dole out rewards according to, you know, algorithms of of reward timings and so on, or how they pump in music and sense. I don't know if they do this, but like to to keep them going, I think they just give them alcohol and that mainly does the work. But um, well, the, one of the things they one of the things they do do is make sure that you don't have a good view of the outside world. So, if you go to any gambling sort of parlor or area in a in a club or a casino or something like that, there's no there's no windows, there's no there's no sort of view of the outside, and that's to make sure that you don't have a good sense of time, how much time has gone by. Oh, I I feel like I got this insight um, through my lived experience where there's a bar in uh in london and soho called the token it's quite famous because it's like the the bar that has the best guinness in london i will put my irish credentialism on that Hmm. to say it's 100 percent the case and the downstairs part of that bar it's like you go down these stairs and you're into like this wee alcove it's all red lit and the seats are big uh like fluffy guinness um, things and stuff and it's it's nice Jimi Hendrix I think played there once and they have some stuff but it's it's got it when you go down into the downstairs bit it's like you know a kind of there's no light and there's no kind of sense of time and they have a clock which which says Guinness time and it only has a uh, like second hand just constantly going round and it, it works it works like when I would go in there you know, whether it was a student or whatever, or like going around lunchtime. And, it, you know, it just felt like after a couple of hours that you were just like, how long were you there? Were you there one hour? Was it five hours? And then you go out and it was daylight and you feel kind of ashamed of what you've done. But the, yeah. yeah, so so I, I felt that. Um, in- my, my, favorite, my favorite Irish bar, I mean, my favorite bar full stop in Brisbane uh, happened to be an Irish bar. This is from when I was young, you know, and you were from, and it was the same. You'd go down these steps and down, down, down. You're in the, the bowels of the, the place. And um, it had all the Irish tat, you know, for the fake, because mm. it's a fake Irish bar, of course. Kid all the stuff around. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you, you know the stuff. Um, but um, so I can't testify to how good the Kilkenny, how authentic the Kilkenny, the pints of Kilkenny were. But to my young impressionable taste buds it was oh so good so we'd, we'd get like so many pints of kilkenny and plates of chips it was just like carbohydrate and alcohol fueled extravaganza it was i have such fond memories of that can i also tell you matt that i didn't drink guinness growing up in ireland not at all i mean i tasted it but i didn't like it and then where i developed my taste for guinness and where guinness became like the pretty much the main thing i i drank for after that was I worked in an Irish bar in London and I was hired for that bar precisely because I was Irish (laughs) (laughs) I like I I went in and they were like have you ever worked in a bar before and like no not really and they were like but you are Irish (laughs) yeah I am well okay okay. and uh but I developed a taste for Guinness at a O'Neill's pub which is like a chain restaurant in London 
And the Guinness there was good. And I, I've had Guinness all over the place, you know, went back and then started drinking Guinness in Ireland. And I will say the, the Guinness in the O'Neill pub that I worked in at least was not bad. So there you go. I learned to like Guinness outside of Ireland. That's my point. That's interesting. That is interesting. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it is mesmerizing. It's the same with Guinness as with Kilkenny. You know, you, they 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 pour it and yeah. it's all the bubble. It's all the bubbles, and they kind of, you know, it gradually. When you work in a bar, yeah. it was the it, it was the most interesting drink to pour. I mean, there's cocktails and stuff, but you know, there was like actually something a bit to it, right? Because yeah, you, like so... I've seen people. I've seen people fail to pour it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, yes. Like screw it. Like screw it up, and then go shit, and then just tip it all out and start again. Yeah. like yeah and you and can draw like, little pictures on that and all that i could draw you know shamrocks and whatnot so yeah oh, all right nice nice yeah. very good very good sorry um, <laughs> sorry it's a, a guinness tangent but um so we so uh, yeah the question was can you could you use your knowledge to like manipulate people to stay at the like smith gambling emporium for uh untold hours yeah, yeah, but I don't think I'd be any better at it and probably a lot worse at it than the professionals, right? Because yeah. the people who are the true professionals is like Crown Casino, Star Star Casino. These these like they have like like they gather data from so they 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 offer thousands of different pokey machines or slot machines, whatever you want to call them. You know, thousands of different variations of them. And they're all electronic. They gather data from every single one of them. And Can so anybody they get that data. No, no, they don't. They don't release it. So they but not release it. But could you break in, <laughs> <laughs> grab it, and just not just run the money, and just leg it, just, leg it. <laughs> just like a really geeky thief. I'm in the casino, like not going for the vault, just going for the the like data repository of the payout <laughs> tables and stuff. I I got some really good data from. So I, I wrote a paper on how hard it is to figure out if you're an expert because there is this class of expert bettors like genuine professionals who actually make money from gambling and they can't make money from slot machines obviously because they're games of pure chance that are rigged to for you to lose right um but you can make money if you're a, a genuine professional at stuff well you can make it at poker yeah playing playing uh, poker and you can make it uh, depending on the quality of the people you're playing against or you can make it at the races right you know dogs and horses and so on and so I wrote this paper on just a statistic, like a statistical type paper on how difficult it is to figure out whether you are actually doing better than chance. So figuring out whether you're doing better than chance is a little bit like if you're investing on the stock market, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, your stock is up, you've, you know, you've made whatever, however many thousand dollars, but you know, were you just lucky or did you pick the right stock? So it's very hard to tell. It takes a uh, you know, you need a lot of information to do that. And it's very deceptive, right? You can get a, the feeling that you're you're an expert at picking stocks or whatever without it being true. And it's the same with gambling and um, picking horses. A lot of people have this delusion. So my paper was called Delusions of Expertise, right? And it was basically based on the idea that you just can't track how much money you've made, even over a period of time. It would take like a decade or two decades of just constant betting to actually um, gather enough sort of information to, if you're just monitoring your bank account, like how much money you'd made, um, whether you're actually genuinely any good at it, right? Because just it's the way the distributions work, right? The way the statistics work. Anyway, so there was this, so this quite famous guy, I've forgotten his name, but he's, he's kind of famous. I think he's from the UK somewhere, but he was a genuine pro. Like he's a multimillionaire uh, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And he made all his money at the Hong Kong racetrack. Right, and he did it by sending boys or you know employees out to collect all the data that he could. You know what I mean? Like the condition of the tracks, all the different horses. I don't know. I don't know what data he collected, but he collected every bit of information that was available, and then gradually built up these predictive models and basically did all his gambling based on that using you know science. Right, and he did very well. Became you know worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and I think he kind of retired. But anyway, he read my paper. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, 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 no. This is, this is, I, I think you're wrong. You know, you know, you can't, I, I, I you can see the personal sort of thing here. I am an expert. Right. And, but thing is um, this gets back to what we we're talking about before he, he was where he was coming from. 
he was assuming these normal distributions that eventually your the, the, your individual returns on these things would converge to a normal distribution. So this is the sort of um, you know basic statistical theory that it doesn't matter what the distribution of the variable is that you're measuring. It could be the outcome of a horse race where it's returning ten to one or hundred to one or whatever. Have this really weird distribution, but if you average over enough trials, it'll converge to a normal distribution, mm -hmm. and that's true most of the time. Um, that that normal approximation is correct, but the distribution from the horse races, because you have these long shot type wins and stuff like that, is so perverse, takes such a long time to converge to a normal distribution. He was actually wrong. And you actually had to use the method I was using, which actually involved convolutions and things, actually. <laughs> 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 anyway, so, so, so here's, here's, here's the moral of the story. He, after exchanging many emails, we had this argument, exchanged many emails, he admitted I was right. Yeah, I, was, and, I was right and he was wrong. Well, was very and, forgiving. and who is better off at the end of that? You <laughs> with the admission or him with the millions, hundreds of millions of dollars? Which one him. is the wealthier man, Matt? Which one? And I know it was this Pyrrhic, a Pyrrhic victory. I had, <laughs> yeah. my, I, I had my email from him saying, yes, you're right. And he had his hundreds of millions of dollars. So well, you, know, you, is... could be the, you, could, you could be the judge, you know? I mean, you know, who's to say? That's right. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's like the gurus, right? Um, because they earn significantly more than us from what they do. Um, but they're bad people. <laughs> so they, so they, are they not bad people? They're just doing bad things. Maybe that's the way to put it. Yeah, especially, you know, the ones that are promoting anti-vaccine hesitancy and stuff, the, uh, that think, kind of think stuff. Of, think about Brene Brown, um, Chris. You know, that it's don't, you know, they, you know, judge the behavior, but, you know. Don't, uh, now, yeah, 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 that's what's, yeah, Brene Brown's all right. She's all right, but I'm sure she earns enough as well. <laughs> she's not it's not doing bad um so delusions of expertise seems it feels like if you continue down the road that we are going with looking at gurus and stuff that you can easily do a part two paper of that like delusions of expertise too no it's not about gambling this time it's it's about the the gurus but that's interesting yeah yeah, I mean, that's that's the weird thing, Chris. I mean, I don't know if it came out from my little potted history, but a lot of the stuff I've been doing has led me in a weird way. It's cosmic. has led me in a way all the way to, to coaching me. the gurus. Like, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, like, yeah. You're my white whale. You're my all the, <laughs> all the forces of the universe were congealing to just lead you slowly to a Skype call with me <laughs> one fateful night uh, about but, but, a year and a half ago. But honestly, it's like this weird confluence of events. Like I was, I was studying anti-vaxxers just because I thought they were interesting um, um, eight years ago. And at the time, it was like, you know, this is just a quirky, weird thing. And we we're studying conspiracy theories and belief in the paranormal and all of these things. And it seemed at the time like irrelevant. Such yeah. Irrelevant. So, I mean, I, it was interesting from a psychological point of view, and that's why I was doing it. And I had no no expectations not the faintest thought that suddenly like that's our news cycle now it's no insane. i can also i have the exact same feeling because like not academically but just you know i was listening to stuff with ancient alien people and getting annoyed i was listening to joe rogan explain that we didn't land on the moon and and podcast devoted to how near-death experiences show that the uh, you know that there is an afterlife and so on and and it was all fringe it always was fringe Rupert Sheldrake Graham Hancock it doesn't matter they were on Rogan or whatever but you know it was still it was niche and there were connections to uh anti-vaccine movements and you know HIV AIDS denialism and so on but it was it it was generally around the fringes and I'm very unhappy that it's no longer the case that like you know when i started seeing conspiracism of that variety become mainstream and and politically mainstream that's the difference because there were always conspiracies there always will be conspiracies but like becoming the kind of dom a dominant force in politics that was 
it was depressing and it still is depressing that like all this stuff that I was interested in is now much more relevant because yeah yeah I wish it wasn't yeah. no <laughs> really? I really wish it wasn't like it was a fun hobby yeah like it was an it was just a curious little thing and you could sort of you know enjoy it and now it seems much too serious and I mean uh, I always find the HIV AIDS denialism hard to enjoy, <laughs> but, I, but, I, yeah. but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And that like, yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's an interesting path that you've wove uh, like across so many fields. And genuinely there's actually a, a useful conversation because my, I now have uh, a much greater appreciation for how many random fields that you have been involved in. Yeah, very <laughs> and, and, and also that you're like, I know that you're statistically competent, but there's statistical competence within the psychology and social science sphere. And there is, you know, broader statistical competence than that. That's right. And, That's right. And, uh, and yeah, Matt, it sounds like you're well, in the... Are, are, are you going to start paying me more respect now? Like, are you going to... You know, defer to me in any way. Shape, On the form? topic of convolutions, yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll, I'll tr trust your asides five percent more about statistics. <laughs> that, that, that's what my Bayesian priors have been updated with. But, yeah. but no, but, but I was, think, I think this is important for the listeners because you know the general thing that you know the snarky kind of comment that you get is like social scientists, sure, you know science yeah. yeah you wouldn't know science if it smacked you right in the face and all oh, very often that's a pretty legit point of view but you know if somebody has actually been involved with engineering building stairs and so on i i kind of have more respect for them. like i'm glad they're i'm glad you're a psychologist now and that you know are involved but it's better that you did other things as well like i i feel superior to the pure psychologist because even, you know, the anthropology field is crazy and it has crazy stuff going on in it. But the one thing they do do is they go out and they hang around with normal people or, you know, interesting people. And they, they're not just in a lab with undergraduate students, like trying to yeah. plumb the, you know, the depths of the universal mind. So like, I, I know not all, I know there are psychologists who go out and do stuff, but like, that is one thing that's good about anthropology and, and having expertise in other things is like you just you don't regard small n experiments with undergraduate students like there's, there's plenty of stuff you can learn from that but you don't you don't automatically generalize it to be a universal model for all of mankind right and i mm -hmm. i see lots of people do that and and yeah, anthropologists are also they have their own issues and limitations so that yeah so, but yeah, we all have limitations. It's all have limitations. We all have limitations. Um, I'll tell you one more little story, which was okay. So now you've you've learned about the amazing breadth and my, girth of my yeah. background. So a little while after being at um, my current university, still a shit kicker, and um, this this sort of other you know high flying research unit was sort of incorporated in the university from Adelaide and. And that they came and visited, right? So we had the, the big the big professor and his kind of eager, eager young sort of, you know, postdocs and, you know, people come. And um, we we're having a few drinks and they said to me, okay, so um, tell me, tell me, what's your background? What's your research? Give me the, give me the, you know, the elevator summary. <laughs> and Another an said, elevator, a flight of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I just said no. I'm not going to do it because I, I literally, I literally couldn't. Like I couldn't imagine. It would be this. <laughs> <laughs> it would be this. It would be an hour long podcast, and I, and so, and I didn't feel like kind of pandering to these bloody kids. That are like saying, okay, tell me your thing, and you know, they're just dorks, you know. And That's... I said, I said no, and and they wouldn't let me off, and it was became quite awkward, and I just refused to because I couldn't, I couldn't even begin. I didn't want to... yeah you didn't want to blow their minds you did what <laughs> with the ocean that's like <laughs> yeah. i know i could go there's the oceans and then there's the i was e in japan there and was... then there was the stairs oh. and there was robots and then yeah. like, like they, they just look at me like i was like mad um 
for this I is mean, so I, I wouldn't do it. Look, I think this is this is good, Mark, because you know I think people should notice that like we've had this podcast for what like a year, a year. over a we've year. Just over, over a year. year. Yeah. yeah. And like it's not like we don't talk about our backgrounds or that kind of thing, but we we don't we haven't focused on our research or this kind of stuff, right? In any of the step, and we won't do it <laughs> again. You will get like you know, these episodes are it. We're not doing this uh, consistently. Right. End of story. That's yeah. Right. Uh, uh, we, uh, so, but I think I want to be like, I'm, you know, I, what's that thing? I'm backpacking. I'm backpacking. But just imagine if this was like the gurus and they had, uh, you know, they had a similar history as what you have. The chance that you wouldn't hear about that and it wouldn't come up in conversation regularly <laughs> that, that they were it'd be, it'd be convolution robots. this and convolution that <laughs> yeah it, it, like so yeah i'm just I, I i think it's good i think it's a good sign that i didn't know any of this even though we've talked many times i mean you know i knew bits and pieces i knew you built um stairs but I, <laughs> that, that's what I thought was the extent of it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, yeah. It's, not that, it's not that interesting. Like it was nice to tell the story and stuff like that, but it is, you know, it's all very technical. It's all very specific. It's, it's useful. I think one of the morals of the story is that a lot of the stuff that's quite useful um, is dull. You know, it's all very dull. Like we're, we're doing stuff that's, you know, it's not unimportant, but it's not, it's not it's not earth shattering or whatever like I, I did things like developing like a review of environmental report card systems for estuaries right across the world right so various estuaries and you take the different samples and different things you can do <laughs> oh, no, it's not interesting it's not interesting it's not going to blow anybody's mind but doing that kind of um, setting up those frameworks measurement frameworks so that you can accurately measure the ecological health of a riverine system and the riparian vegetation around it and the estuaries and so on that's important that's important I mean, for the yeah. fish. if you're a, if you're a fish in that estuary you, you'd care you know you would you would you'd, <laughs> you'd bloody hell i've been waiting for someone to publish this for years <laughs> but they uh yeah like look and i, I think you know we are we are decades apart in age at completely the right Hang on, decades, Dec <laughs> centuries, <laughs> almost centuries away. And, uh, you know, the, you're at the end of, you're approaching the end of your life. I'm at the start of mine. <laughs> and uh, we, the, despite this, I, I want to say that like this, these we're just two like random academics right and we we have interest in conspiracy theories and all this kind of stuff you you all know this if you're listening to this but this is why we are skeptical about all the stuff that you hear like what matt talked about there right how much of that was about the culture war zippo zippo maybe gambling can sort of be tied into it a bit with social justice activism but it wasn't a big part of the story my research about you know the religion and rituals it's not about culture war stuff. It's not what people are debating, unless Bo Weingart publishes a paper on it. But then, <laughs> then uh, so that's what makes me skeptical about all the claims of how, you know, academia is all about that. It isn't all about that. It's about this boring stuff that we're <laughs> telling you. <laughs> and, uh, and it doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, th th that this doesn't have an impact in, in America or, you know, the managerial things or whatever is going on. It, it, it's a debate to be had about the extent to which various things are impacting academia from a political point of view. But I, yeah, I just want to highlight that this is the kind of reason we're skeptical of those super broad narratives. And Matt, it seems that you've frozen. This is unfortunate because we were almost reaching the end. So um, I'll try. I'll try to sign off in case we end here. Um, but we might tab on an end. So thanks everybody for listening. Matt's obviously done much more important and and despite what he says, interesting research than I have on my side. Um, 
but we hope you enjoyed this self-indulgent waffle from from Matt this week and from myself previously. As I say, this won't happen <laughs> again. So um, so enjoy. And uh, next time for these kind of stuff, we'll be talking more about actual research and articles and that kind of thing. Okay. Bye-bye.